good day. I have to say that because I don't realize, I came to realize I don't know what time of the day you're watching this, so we'll say good day for today. Um, <clears throat> wow, this is our third week into a video lesson. Actually, I think for you guys, maybe it's week two for video lesson. Um, what we want to do is we have finished up our hydrocarbon chapter, and we are going to get started in a new chapter. And I'll have something on here that you'll need to fill out and have ready for me by class on Thursday. So I'll put a note on Kia that you need to be sure and watch because there are requirements for you to have. All right, so we're going to get started. Um, we've talked about polymers, and we understand polymers a little bit more. Maybe I'm hoping that we understand polymers a little bit better than we did when we first started. So we know that polymers are hydrocarbons. We're going to go and meet um, some other life-changing, society-changing things, materials that have been found through history. In fact, history gets named after them. And, and so you've heard of the Bronze Age. Well, guess what? They figured out how to make bronze. We're going to talk a little bit about what's involved in that, at least the component-wise. And then there's the Iron Age, and there's the Stone Age, and, you know. So it's really interesting that we date histor historically kind of materials that were used. And so that's what this chapter is about. It's about the history of materials through time, kind of. I like to see it that way, anyway. All right, so we will start with a list. And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to fill in this list. So the first thing we want to write down is bronze. And instead of me telling you what it's composed of, that is what your job is. So you'll have to tell me what is the composition of bronze. And again, biblically, we can see that the outer court was made of bronze altar, a bronze laver. And so we can go all the way back to the history of the Bible and see that they were able to use bronze, make it back in that point in time. So what I'm asking you to do in terms of bronze, its composition, tell me what it is used for today. What are its uses? And we'll kind of talk about that. Um, every time I open a handle <laughs> um, that's an older on an older door, a lot of times the handle's made out of a bronze. And so the question would be, hmm, why did they make the handles on a lot of doors? And I can imagine if you haven't ever noticed, start noticing that when you go to like a courthouse or a big public building of some sort, a lot of times it's a big bronze handle. So the question you might want to ask is, wonder why bronze is being used. The next one I want you to explore is brass. Tell me what are the components. Now they're very close and sometimes in biblical translations they'll go between bronze and brass and kind of lump them in the same category, but they're not. They're totally two different types of compositions. You've got to tell me what that is and what it's used for today. Sterling silver What is it? What makes it not just silver, but the sterling part of silver? And the uses for it. Pewter. What it's composed of and its uses. Now, if you've ever heard of soldering wires, if you're into any kind of electronics, then perhaps you've had to solder some wires before or your parents have had to solder wires before and they have a little soldering iron and they have a little bit of that metal and it has such a low melting point you don't have to get it too hot before it begins to drip and it kind of seals a connection in a electrical device. So solder, I've kind of told you a little bit of its use but you have to tell me what it's composed of. And then the last thing is called rot iron. Not just iron, but what is the wrought iron? What is composed in wrought iron? 
and why is it put in there and what are the uses? A long time ago, I don't know if you've noticed, um, I don't know how many they have here in Georgia. When I was growing up, in this little older town in Kentucky, there were houses that had wrought iron fences. And so that was a big thing, kind of a stylistic thing during a certain time period. So again, you need to make this list. I'm gonna call on you and as part of your homework to be ready for showing me that you watched this. Tell me the composition and tell me the uses. You should be able to get that out of your book. Of course, you can also Google them. That's one and the same to me. Just you finding out the information is good. All right, so we're gonna erase that. You might wanna pause, make again, make this chart and have it ready so you can get your class grade, um, participation in class grade going. All right, so we're gonna erase this and we will begin. We'll probably get the whole chapter done today. Today's chapter is not any challenge conceptually like the last chapter. So a lot of times the book will give you a hard chapter and then it'll give you a break on the next chapter. And this is your break in this particular chapter. All right, so the way I wanna do this section is to, probably gonna answer some of your questions if you haven't marked them up, is we're gonna look at alloys. What are they and what are some of the main alloys that are out there? If you look at a periodic table, which don't seem to have one right in front of me, but if you take a metal and a non-metal, you have an ionic compound. If you take two non-metals, like H2O, none of those are metals, you have a covalent compound where they're sharing. But if you have metal and metal, what do you have? Well, you have a mixture, not even a sharing, but a mixture of metals. That's what an alloy is. It can be metal and maybe another material other than metal mixed in. So alloys, first of all, are mixtures, which technically means there's not really true bonding going on in a mixture. We haven't really talked a lot about that, um, but otherwise we call it an alloy compound, and that would tell you the word compound would let you know bonds were being had, but they're not. It's just a mixture. And again, over here to the side, if I'm going to show you a little bit of a picture of what metals are like, they loosely hold their outer valence electrons so they become more like a sea of electrons. Literally a sea of, the E minus of course, is for electron. And so they're floating and it's easy for electrons to move around. That's what gives metals shininess. That's what gives metals their conductivity. These electrons are really very easily to dislocate and to move around. That's again, all the properties of a metal are there. Uh, so when we begin to put other things in here, they are also going to be able to mix in without necessarily form forming a bond. Okay, so again, an alloy is a mixture of, you gotta have a metal plus one or more elements. And voila, you have an alloy. So what's really interesting, because it's a mixture, the metals retain some of their properties. So basically you have a blending of properties going on in an alloy. All right, so let's take a look. Let's go back in time. Um, maybe this isn't exactly in the, um, the realm of history, but we're gonna look at some different alloys. We have brass. In fact, that word brass is used as a musical 
uh, grouping of instruments that are made out of brass metals. And if you're not one of those instruments, you might be a woodwind. It's normally woodwinds, brass, and percussion. So what are the compositions of brass? Well, brass looks like it's gold. It has a gold look to it. And it gets that gold when you take copper, Cu, and you combine it with zinc. Okay. Now, we've done this lab before in class where we take a copper penny and we put that penny in sodium hydroxide and put a little bit of zinc powder in there and all of a sudden that zinc, which is silver, begins to plate out on the copper of the penny and when you take it out, you keep cooking it until all the outside of the penny is silver. But then you put it on a, a hot area and all of a sudden, the copper and the zinc then begin to mix together like this. They make this mixture, and it turns from silver to gold right in front of your eyes. It's really the coolest thing. So brass is a mixture of copper and zinc. Um, because, now I'm just thinking outside the box, not saying you should do this, but typically on the outside of a penny is copper, and on the inside of a penny, whether you knew it or not, it's zinc. So technically, if you took a penny and heated it up to the point of destroying the penny, and I believe that's a felony, but so I wouldn't be doing it. But if you mix these two, they should actually turn a brass color, a brass mixture, because copper on the outside, zinc on the inside. If you heated them up, and they would were to make an alloy, you'd get a brass glob of metal because it would lose its form once you heated it up. Okay, the next one we want to look at is bronze. And bronze, again, I said the Bible will use brass and bronze as one, and you're going to see you can't do that because, of course, we have copper just like we did on the brass, but the bronze part is tin, S-N. Tin. That's what gives you a bronze. Bronze can take a lot of heat. So it was used on the altar on the outside. But again, it's uh, symbolizing something that's maybe not as high a level of metals. And that's why it's on the outside of the courtyard in the tabernacle of Moses. Okay, let's look at jeweler's gold. Why would we call it not just gold, but jeweler's gold. What do you know about gold that makes it uh, need something added to it in order to make it use for jewelry? If it, anything's pure gold, now this is really, again, I'm gonna go back to the Tabernacle of Moses. There is a mystery here. Um, once you get into the holy place, there is a menorah that's made of pure beaten gold. And that is unusual because most of the time, gold is so soft, it cannot retain the form as well because it's so soft. And so a jeweler is going to take gold, A-U, and he's going to mix it with silver, A-G. And depending on how much silver is mixed in there, you're going to have various carrots. So let's say we have a 12 carat, 12 K-A-R-R-O-T. 12 carat is going to be 50% copper. You know, I put A-G there. It's not silver, it's copper. Oh, sorry about that. So 50% copper. We'll just put CU for copper. And then again, if you have 14 carat, and we'll use ditto marks, it's going to be 42% less, and that's going to make it more gold. And then, of course, we have our highest, which is 22 carat, and that's going to be 8%, not very much copper and a whole 
lot of gold. So that's where the carrots come in as to how much mixture of copper is going in there. And the copper is going to give it the strength to hold its form. Next one's kind of an interesting conversation piece. And it's called dental amalgam. Dental amalgam. Oh, we've got three things going on here. First of all, we have mercury, Hg, and then we have silver, Ag, and then there's a degree of zinc in there. That kind of reminds us a little bit, well, let's just go back to Hg. You know, when you think about mercury, you know it's poisonous, and... You know that it's not bonded, so it's not losing its full properties because it's in a mixture as an alloy. A lot of people have said, that is not good for you. When you have your teeth feel, filled and it's a silver filling, this is what you have going on. And there's mercury involved. There have been even people that have gone to the extent of having all their silver fillings removed from their teeth. And then they've had them replaced with, now they have a resin, so they don't even use the silver amalgam as much anymore. They'll use the resin, which is very tough. Um, but people who have a very low immunity, maybe they're just prone to a lot of difficulties because of their low immunity, um, have actually had success in feeling a lot better once they've had this done. And again, it would vary from person to person. The last one we want to talk about is steel put it down here so we've got a little bit of room. Now, anytime you hear the word steel, you know that the metal iron is involved in steel. But if you know anything about pure iron, you know that iron rusts. <laughs> so pure steel is not going to be the best mixture. We've got to put something else in there that is going to keep it from rusting or at least to minimize the rust. And carbon is one of the things that they will put in with steel. And then there's other options, which I'll just leave it open because there's a place in your book where you can go look and see all the different things that can be added in here. And you're gonna get different levels of steel for different purposes. Okay, so this is kind of a good outlay <clears throat> on all the alloys that have been used. So let's move on and get away from the metals and go to for the most part something that has been used as a material that is not metal in time in fact this one has been used it's ancient so we don't even have a, a year to put on it we're going to call it ceramics ceramics and it's made, if it's got ceramics, it's made from dry clay, which we have a lot of dry clay here in Georgia, and clay-like mixtures. Met a man one time who got into studying the pottery that the Indians made here in Georgia. And so he even studied it to the point where he built his own outdoor kiln. And he would go and look for places where there was pure clay. You know you have pure clay here in Georgia when it's not red. See, red means the clay has iron in it that's rusted, and therefore you get the red. So rusty clay is uh, not pure clay. But if you find a layer of clay that's kind of a whitish, tannish color, there you have your, your pure clay. One of the resources that's mined in Georgia is clay. It's called kaolin. Kaolin is really big industry. And kaolin, <clears throat> let me just put it over here, kaolin, K-A-O-L-I-N, is a pure white clay found near the fall line of Georgia. You come down out of the Piedmont and there's an ancient seabed 
that makes up the rest of the lower part of South Georgia. And the minute you transfer from Piedmont into the coastal plain, you know it because types of trees change, it flattens out, you're not in rolling hills anymore. So it's right along this, what they call fall line, because literally the land falls. And there's a lot of different waterfalls that are found along the fall line. It goes through Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. <clears throat> anyway, kaolin, we have a large deposits of kaolin clay in Georgia. Now they don't use it for pottery for the most part. They use kaolin in a glossy type of covering like a magazine's pages are very glossy. That's kaolin adding to that glossiness. And so it's mined, it's big business. Um, there's other parts of the world that has kaolin deposits, but we have a fairly significant one here. I used to think I'd get into that industry when I was going through school, but it wound up not being the case. I didn't get into that. Let me 